One of the great criticisms aimed at those who believe in God is the supposed inactivity of God in the world. And you've only got to look at the news this week. 50, 60, 70 people killed in clashes between the Israelis and the Palestinians in, of all places, the Holy Land. A rioting has escalated, buildings are bombs, rockets are fired. Then there's the unfolding crisis in India, people dying in corridors and cars because they can't find a hospital bed and there isn't enough oxygen. I mean, oxygen for heaven's sake. Stories of helplessness and hopelessness are everywhere. Bodies burnt in cremation pyres in the open streets. It's unrecognisable. Then, of course, there's the constant news about the latest shooting in some school or other in the US, the ever-present problems of our climate change, the problems in Myanmar, and so it just goes on and on and on. So how do we respond to that as Christians? How do we answer the questions that people ask about why God doesn't act in this world to bring about change? And actually, we probably have some sympathy with the questioners at times. And why doesn't God do something about the mess in our world? And we've probably all been faced with that question by someone, either genuinely asking it, seeking an answer, or someone who seeks to challenge or undermine our faith. Of course, Jesus' disciples asked the same question of him after his resurrection. It was the reading that we heard today. Lord, are you, no, you, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Are you going to right the wrongs that happened when you were crucified? What are you going to do? Well, I guess that's a question that we might all understand and with which... Uh, we might also have some sympathy. After all, look at what those men had gone through. They had gone to Jerusalem expecting Jesus to establish a new Israel, to kick out the Romans and the corrupt religious leaders of the day, and to be part of the new order, perhaps even Jesus' council of ministers. And instead, they had experienced betrayal from within, the arrest and brutalising of Jesus, and then they'd had to watch as he was crucified, and their own conduct as followers brought into question by all of them running away and abandoning Jesus just when it counted the most. But then he rises from the dead. I mean, what do you do after that? As I said on Ascension Day, what do you do as an encore to the resurrection? Well, of course, we know the answer to that, but they didn't. And what was Jesus' response to their question? Wait. Wait for the gift that God is going to give you. Today, the Sunday after Ascension, is one of my favourite Sundays of the year, sandwiched between Ascension Day and Pentecost. And the Church of England really got its act together on this Sunday with regard to the blessing written for this particular Sunday, and we'll come on to that later uh, in the service. But it's the Sunday when we wait, but we wait with purpose and anticipation. And of course, in many ways, it resonates with where we are at the moment as a church and as a community as we emerge from COVID. Well, what now? What's going to happen next? I mean, there's lots of uncertainty. What is God going to do? Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom? It's the question on the edge of our lips, really. So, to some extent, we know what those disciples felt like as they waited. But, of course, there was a surprise in store for those men, and they couldn't begin to imagine how their questions were going to be answered, because it wasn't going to be God doing it. Uh, uh, well, at least not in the way that they thought. Instead, Jesus told them to wait and be ready and his spirit would come upon them and they would be the ones to grow the kingdom. God was going to equip them. They were not going to be passive and docile watchers waiting around for someone else to do the work. They were going to be involved. 
I remember when I first arrived at my last post in the other island and one of the congregation came up to me and said, I'm so glad you're here. And I thought, oh, that's lovely. And then they said, now I can give you back all the things that I've had to do in the interregnum. And I said, I'm really pleased to be here, but I think you've really misunderstood what Christian ministry is all about. God hasn't just equipped me, he's equipped you too. So let's do it together. We are the body of Christ. And you know that begins to give us an answer to some of those questions we asked earlier. Why doesn't God do something about the mess? Why doesn't God act? And here's the answer to those questions. Are you ready? Because it's another question. Have you ever thought that God might be asking you the same question? Why aren't you acting? Why aren't you involved? Why aren't you doing something about the mess and the injustices and the inequality? I've equipped you. I've given you the gifts. You have my spirit. Go and be my witnesses in a divided and suffering world. And this Sunday after the Ascension and before Pentecost is a really good time to ponder the challenge of being part of the solution. We've talked in this series of sermons on Acts about not just being an attractional church where people come to us, but also to be a missional church where we are called to go out. And we've kind of laboured that point over these last few weeks in our sermons on the Acts of the Apostles. And here in chapter 1 of Acts, Jesus talks about that going out. You'll be my witnesses in Judea, in Samaria and to the ends of the world. That outward facing Go into the places where I not, might not be welcome or comfortable or sure of my ground. Centrifugal missional work to which we are called. We, we are all called to live out our faith in this world in the nooks and crannies of everyday life. To demonstrate God's selfless love in a world where might is right and greed is good and me, me, me is the mission statement by which so many people live their lives. Christians are called to choose the costlier option, the one that serves others before self, and to build a loving society where we can dare to love selflessly because we have the security of being selflessly loved by God himself. And the answer to the question of why doesn't God intervene in the mess of this world is that he does through his people. I mean, it's not the whole answer, of course, and I'm not trying to be trite or glib there. What I'm trying to do is suggest that we don't just leave it and, and acquiesce. And when you look at the Acts of the Apostles, that's what the whole book is about. It's written to Theophilus, which of course means those who love God. So it's written to you and I so that we, like those in Acts, might intervene. And it is what this church and every church is called to do. So here we sit, waiting for COVID to release us back to our lives and to be church. What are we going to do? Will we ask the question, what is someone else going to do about building up our church again? Or are we going to be part of the solution? looking outwards prayerfully, purposefully, and positively. Now in our gospel reading this morning from John 17, Jesus makes it clear that he is to be glorified through his followers. Well, what an extraordinary responsibility and privilege that is. How might you glorify God this week, prayerfully, purposefully, and positively? He also causes followers to be sanctified, to be made holy for a purpose. And Jesus says to God, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. So the questions that every member of a church should be asking in, the day, in our daily life is, what can I do to promote ministry and mission in this church, in my life, in this community? How can I be part of the solution? to the problems and challenges in our community? How can I demonstrate purposeful holiness in my life, in this church, in this town, in this island? 
How might I more selflessly love? You know, these are the marks of a Christian community. So this Sunday between Ascension and Pentecost, as we wait, is an opportunity for us to pray. Inspire me with the presence of your Holy Spirit as you did those disciples, so that I may work for you, so that I may confess Jesus Christ as Lord and proclaim the word and works of God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we ponder those deep and difficult questions and as we try to avoid the trite answers that are so easy to give, help us to remember that you call us to go out. So in this coming week, Heavenly Father, help us through our words and our actions and our thoughts to glorify you. Make us holy for a purpose, Lord. Let us be sanctified through the work of your Holy Spirit within us. And help us, Lord, to ask those more difficult questions of ourselves, not to hold back in fear, but to be willing to say, let me be part of the solution of growing the mission and ministry of this church. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen and ascended Lord. Amen. Well, thank you so much for listening to the sermon today, and I really hope that you have a blessed week.